right right about now the funk soul brother check it out now the funk soul brother right about now the funk soul brother check it out now the funk soul brother right about now the funk soul brother check it out now the funk soul brother right about now the funk soul brother right about now about now about now about now what's poppin y'all it's a man claw boy bales and welcome to another episode of wisco sports weekly where today's episode i feel like is a little bit of a fun one as a packers fan we have our hatred and we have our rivalries with our opposing teams in our division one thing that i know is that sports fans suffer plenty of heartbreak over the years but low-key no one has suffered more heartbreak than the minnesota vikings fan base Pretty much, there hasn't been much happiness in their fan base, especially since the Vikings still have not to this day won a Super Bowl in their franchise's history. After all the trash talk I've ever seen from the Vikings fans over the years, especially this year since they won the division and we suck this year, you know, and especially after their embarrassing blunder that happened in the playoffs this year, it reminded me of all the hilarious moments that's happened to their franchise all over the years. So of course, I decided to make this video of the greatest moments that's happened in their history that make me incredibly happy and them absolutely depressed and question why do they keep on supporting this team every single year. So without further ado, after much research, here are the top 10 worst moments in the Minnesota Vikings franchise history. If you like what you see, please subscribe for more content and comment below with your thoughts. Number 10, the 2018 NFC Championship Game. This itself is just hilarious. The Super Bowl was going to be held at US Bank Stadium that year, and Minnesota was playing for the chance to be the first team in NFL history to have a home field advantage in the Super Bowl. That itself is a huge deal given the fact that one week earlier, the Minneapolis miracle took place. Minnesota going into this game was the favorite to win due to the Philadelphia Eagles starting quarterback Carson Wentz suffering an ACL tear before playoffs and leaving this game up to veteran Nick Foles to get it done. Philly barely got past the 60 to Falcons, so of course the signs were pointing to Minnesota to get the job done. Minnesota went down the field and scored the opening touchdown, and the realization kicked in, and people completely remember that Case Keenum really isn't a good quarterback. After throwing a pick six, pretty much the Eagles got the momentum and Nick Foles took over. From the second quarter on, this seemed like an absolute embarrassment for Vikings fans because one week ago sure was all the momentum and basically that was all for nothing. If they would have won this game, it would make you think would they have competed with Tom Brady in a home Super Bowl game? What's even better is that after the game, those trash talking Philly fans, they were doing the skull chant but chanting Foles instead. Philly would end up winning the Super Bowl that year. Number 9 the 2001 NFC Championship Game. In the 2000 season, Dante Culpepper had burst onto the scene. He led the league in touchdown passes that year. Chris Carter and Randy Moss, well, they continued terrorizing opposing secondaries, and Robert Smith, he literally had the best season in his career with 1,500 rushing yards. And then they traveled to the Meadowlands. They were actually favored to beat the Giants and go to the Super Bowl. I mean, there was a lot of talk leading up to that 2001 NFC Championship game that the 12-4 New York Giants had gotten a fat on schedule made up of cupcakes and that the number one seed in the NFC would get exposed in the playoffs this year. Plenty of people thought Minnesota would be the team to end this Giants mirage. But unfortunately, the Vikings, yeah, they looked nothing like the team that won 11 games in the regular season and instead found themselves on the losing side of a 41-0 blowout. Not a whole lot that you could say about that. Robert Smith retired in the offseason and the Vikings wouldn't make the playoffs for another four years. Number 8, 4th and 24. In the 2003 season, the Vikings jumped out to a 6-0 start. Culpepper and Moss were lighting up the highlight reels and the defense was doing a good enough job to not blow all the leads they lost last year. When reality started sinking in as the Vikings lost their next four in a row, all against teams who finished with losing records, eventually it all came down to one game in Arizona against a 3-12 Cardinals team. If the Vikings won, they would have won the NFC North, lose and the Packers would. Despite being this game closer than it should have, it looked like the Vikings would win. Up 17-12, they had just sacked Josh McCown on third down and with no timeouts left and unable to spike the ball, the Cardinals had only time for one no huddle shot down the field well i guess the best thing that i can say is that paul allen's call says it best 
takes the snap. He steps up. He's all by himself. Fires into the end zone. Touch! Touchdown! No! No! The Cardinals have knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs. I believe it was caught by Nate Poole. He's being mugged by his Cardinal teammates. There are Minnesota Vikings crying on the field. Number seven, the 2005 season. The 2005 season was supposed to be a great one. Dante Culpepper was coming off a record-breaking season, the Randy Moss headache was gone, the defense added stars like Darren Sharper and Pat Williams, and Minnesota looked ready for a Super Bowl. Instead, well, they went backwards. First, in the 2005 NFL Draft, they traded Randy Moss to the Raiders. Minnesota found itself with the number 7 and 18 selections, who they drafted Troy Williamson and Erasmus James. While this didn't seem so bad at the time, seven years later it became known as a draft of missed opportunities. Troy Williamson could never catch the ball and was traded away after only three seasons. Erasmus James struggled with injuries and also was gone after a mere three seasons. To make matters worse, all pros Demarcus Ware and Roddy White were available at the number 7 and 18 picks. Then came the Love Boat scandal. When news stations like CNN are reporting on a sports team, yeah, you know the team has to have done something very, very wrong. Some players like to spend their bye weeks resting or visiting family. Some apparently like to rent boats and have sex parties on a lake. 17 players, including Dante Culpepper and Fred Smoot, rented a pair of houseboats and had a party with about 90 other people on Lake Minnetonka. Prostitutes from Atlanta and Florida performed sex acts for some of the players in front of crew members, among other things. For obvious reasons, I'm not going to go into detail on what happened that night, but needless to say, it's certainly one of the most embarrassing pieces of press the Vikings could have garnered, and certainly the most disgusting. And finally, how to make a bad season even worse? Well, how about having your franchise quarterback suffer a career-ending injury? Even though he was having an abysmal season, Dante Culpepper was still a dynamic playmaker for the Vikings. With one play in an October game against the Carolina Panthers, Culpepper suffered a tear to three ligaments in his knee. After the season, he was traded to the Dolphins and was never the same player again. What a rough year. Number 6. The Roger Staubach Hail Mary Up 14-10 in the divisional round of the 1975 playoffs, the Vikings had the Cowboys at midfield with only 24 seconds left to play. Roger Staubach took the snap and just threw a prayer to the end zone's Drew Pearson. After what appeared to be contact from Pearson, the ball landed safely against his hip as he waltzed into the end zone. Fans were so ticked at the lack of penalty against the Cowboys in that game that one fan actually threw a whiskey bottle at one, hitting him in the head and knocking him unconscious. Of course, many people still to this day believe he was pushed off and that play should have been an offensive PI and should have not have counted. Whether or not Pearson actually pushed off, losing on a Hail Mary, especially in the playoffs, is just humiliating in itself for any franchise. Number 5. Blair Walsh Before an unfortunate knee injury turned his NFL career upside down, Teddy Bridgewater helped lead the Vikings to a successful 2015 campaign that resulted in the team winning the NFC North and hosting the Seattle Seahawks in the first round of the playoffs. Minnesota had the opportunity to continue their success in 2015, and all they needed to do was get a win over the Seahawks. With the January freezing cold of the Twin Cities as their advantage, the Vikings seemed to have a good shot at defending a Seattle team that was coming off a Super Bowl appearance in 2014. This game was far from a shootout, but Minnesota held a 9-0 lead against the Seahawks as the two teams headed into the fourth quarter. Seattle was then able to score a touchdown and a field goal on back-to-back -back drives, and they took a one-point lead over the Vikings with around eight minutes left in the matchup. Later, thanks to a long pass to Kyle Rudolph and a few short runs by Adrian Peterson, Minnesota found themselves facing a 4th and 1 on the Seattle 9-yard line with only 26 seconds left in the game. All the Vikings needed to do to advance to the next round of the playoffs was for Blair Walsh to come in and make a 27-yard field goal. That's it. It was that simple. Walsh already converted on three field goal tries during the matchup of 22, 43, and 47 yards, so this final attempt seemed like a walk in the park, right? Blair Walsh from 27 yards left hash. Snap good, spot down, Walsh's kick is up, and it is no good, he missed it! Are you kidding me? The season can't end like that! He missed it left! And the Seattle... Unfortunately for Minnesota and their kicker, he missed the easy field goal try, and the Seahawks ended up escaping with a 10-9 victory. Number 4. The 2010 NFC Championship Game 
Well, does the name Brett Favre ring a bell? After his historic runs with the Green Bay Packers, he was the Vikings quarterback for his final two seasons in the league, leading them to an NFC Championship game against the Bounty Gate New Orleans Saints. Hale is one of the best quarterbacks of all time, Favre surely could bring the Vikings a win and bring them to a Super Bowl, but instead, tragedy struck and it ended up being a game that pisses off Vikings fans to this day. After many AP fumbles and some biased pass interference calls and a completely missed 12 men on the field call, it ended up being a tie game with the Vikings having the ball. Just outside field goal range and the final seconds clicking down, it was third down and pretty much all you had to do was not be stupid, but as a Packers fan, we know that Brett Favre has many times screwed up in these clutch situations. Obviously, Paul Allen has the call. Favre goes back to pass, he pumps. Now he fires over the middle, intercepted. I can't believe what I'm seeing right now. It was intercepted by Tracy Porter, near side to the 40, and John Sullivan runs him down at the 47 yard line. You've gotta be kidding me, I can't believe what I just saw. Looking at that play, he should have just held on to a ball. He should have. He could have easily gotten five or six yards if he would have just pulled that thing down and dove forward. But why do you even ponder passing? I mean, you can take a knee and try a 56-yard field goal. This is not Detroit, man. This is the Super Bowl. Later, the Saints were punished for putting a bounty on Favre during the game, awarding 10000 to anyone who could knock him out. After being battered, he retired another season with the Vikings, and despite his impressive quarterback track record, he ended his career as a fallen hero. Number 3. The Herschel Walker Trade Well, this is hilarious. His high rate reel from Georgia is absolutely legendary to this day. However, Minnesota Vikings fans, well, they have a different take on his NFL career. In 1989, the Vikings felt that they were one missing piece away from a Super Bowl run. The Cowboys were rebuilding and trading the only bargaining chip that they had. Mike Lynn, the Vikes GM at the time, agreed to send eight draft picks, including three first rounders and five players to the Cowboys for number 34, Herschel Walker. Walker rushed for only 2,200 yards in three seasons, never gaining a thousand in a year. The Cowboys on the other hand, well, they used the picks to acquire the draft players like Emmett Smith and Darren Woodson among others who would help the Cowboys win three Super Bowls. The Vikings essentially created the Cowboys dynasty of the 90s, so I guess Cowboys fans do have something to be thankful for, I guess. Number 2. The Vikings lost four Super Bowls. Before the Bills came around, the Vikings were the standard bearers for big game futility. Minnesota made four Super Bowls in an eight year span under Hall of Fame coach Bud Grant, behind players such as Fran Tarkenton, Chuck Foreman, Paul Krause, and the vaunted Purple People Eaters, the Vikings lost every single time. The silver lining in these losses is that they weren't nail biters or lost on close calls. The Vikings were overmatched every single time, getting outscored 95-34 to in the four games. In fact, their closest game was a 16-6 loss in Pittsburgh in Super Bowl IX, where Steelers' Iron Curtain held the Vikings to 119 total yards and Minnesota's only score came on special teams, a balked punt return for a touchdown. Years after losing to the Raiders in Super Bowl XI, the Vikings have yet to play for the Lombardi Trophy again. And of course, number one, Gary Anderson. The Vikings were truly awesome in 1998, as they had a 15-1 record. They were the best team in the league that year, and everyone thought they were unstoppable. They were 2 minutes and 11 seconds away from punching their ticket to the Super Bowl when the unthinkable happened. Gary Anderson hadn't missed a field goal in two years. The All-Pro took the field with Minnesota, leading Atlanta 27-20, and Anderson in a position to put the game to bed. Anderson was perfect that season, 35 for 35 on field goals and 59 for 59 on extra points, and was on a streak of 122 consecutive makes dating back to December 5, 1997. Unfortunately, Anderson's kick from the left Hash missed wide left from 38 yards. Nothing went wrong. The snap and the hold were both good. The conditions were ideal. They were in a dome he just missed. Unfortunately, Chris Chandler went to lead Atlanta on a game-tying touchdown drive, and the Falcons won it in overtime when Atlanta's Morton Anderson booted, you guessed it, a 38-yarder. 
Not only is this the most painful loss in Vikings history, it may be the most agonizing miss in NFL history to this day. It also created a great what-if scenario. What if the Vikings, not the Falcons, had faced John Elway and the Broncos in that year's Super Bowl? There is one play that showcases how much failures the Minnesota Vikings have endured. This is probably the first play anyone thinks of to this day. So, if you like what you see, comment below and subscribe for more content. And we will see you next time.